Welcome everybody to Spartan Up Podcast. Today we've got a great and unique podcast for you. Joe sat down with Major Nicole Alexander. This is a young woman who's got a lot of life lessons and a lot to teach us. She started off as a young girl as a ballerina, went to college and won a national rowing championship. So imagine that transition. She is now the commander of a U.S. Army Special Operations Unit. 2011, we were doing what's called village stability operations. And so we were living in towns and villages uh, in mud huts out there. And so um, it was me, my civil affairs team, which was four people, a special forces uh, detachment, which is about 12 people, and then some infantry guys um, to help with security, and then our Afghans. So about 30 some odd people living out there. So this woman has already lived a lot of experiences. has got a lot to share with us. So I hope you uh, you get as much out of this as I do. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Gone Rogue High Protein Chips. 17 grams of protein in one crunchy ounce. Visit GoneRogueSnacks.com, enter promo code SPARTAN25 for 25% off. So, Spartan Up. We are here at West Point. We're doing a whole series of interviews with just amazing um, military folks, and uh, this is no different. Nicole Alexander, kind of an underachiever in many ways. Um, I'm kidding. She is a superstar, and I think I think you're going to be able to teach the audience, which is what we're all about, how to take it not only to the next level, but like a moonshot. So I'm trying to at least. You start with ballet. Yep. So funny thing is that my mom really wanted me to get into ballet. LA and I cried where, all the time. Where, where, where so I grew up in Olympia, Washington, okay. uh, the capital of Washington, not Seattle. All right. um, and uh, that's big where ballet, we settled. Big ballet town? Not really. Not at all. Um, but it's something my mom always wanted. And so... How old are you? Uh, I think kindergarten. Kindergarten Started ballet. really young. All yep. Right. My daughter, I have a three and a half year old. She started ballet a year ago. Nice. So I'm just keeping it in the family. Um, is, my mom and is was mom, not a dancer. Is mom a hard... Charger. She's a hard charger. She's pretty amazing. Um, so both my parents were in the military. Um, my mom was part of the second class that had field artillery women in it. Wow. Um, and so all of my growing up, um, my mom worked, um, my dad worked, and my mom actually changed her career to be an engineer. And so she's going, you know, while she's raising me, taking me to all my activities, uh, she's also going to school at night and working during the day. How hard is ballet? It's pretty difficult. It's yeah. pretty difficult, but it's amazing once you get it. So I hated it for like the good first three or four years. Cried all the time about it. Um, yeah, my, and mom, my mom said I don't mom really was care. like, yep, nope, you got to do this. You'll love it. And sure enough, one day it was amazing. And we had this incredible company there. And so um, you had classes, you were a part of company, and then you got to do performances. So we did winter. Explain, and I, I think that's such an awesome word associated with ballet, company. Company, yeah. So that's a group of ballerinas. It's a group, yep, it's a group of ballerinas uh, yeah. and men and... Uh, uh, and that's, you know, we, we train, we practice, we rehearse. And, How much do you train? Um, so I was doing classes probably three days a week. And then when it was, it was always, we were rehearsing for a performance. And so that was usually about two days a week as well. Okay. And then I was also so doing like an hour, two hours. Yeah, about an hour, two hours. Okay. Um, and then I was in tennis and I was in volleyball, um, nice. all year long as well. So and then what about, what about schoolwork? Was she, did she push schoolwork? Yep. Mom? Yep. Really tough on school. Um, I was not an A student. I was generally an A student. I did pretty well for myself, but, um, there are a few times when my club activities were um, I took more, you know, I was more in tune to those than my school. And so then I had a rough, I had a rough quarter a few times. Um, unfortunately, also leading right into college applications. So that was a little tough. Um, and she, yeah. and she just grinded you. Your yeah. Mom. And you, did you hate her at times? No, no. Uh-huh. I mean, we had the typical sometimes when you're in high school, like mom and dad or mom mm-hmm. and daughter thing. Um, but I loved it. I wouldn't have done all these things. But activities. you love it now. You didn't love it at the time. I did. Really? I really did. I really did. I uh, You loved... were like, Mom, make me do more. <laughs> more. I always wanted to add more. Really? Um, yeah. I love being busy. Um, and it's a constant theme of my life um, is as many activities and things that you can. So so somebody out there listening, um, do you think that's something? Like, because people are sitting on the couch saying, yeah. well, she's different. Yeah. Do you, or do you think we should all just... I think you should get and do as much as you can. Um, be active. You don't have to be great at it. I am not... I was not great. I didn't... I wasn't uh, the number one star player on the team. Uh, I didn't get a Division One athlete uh, scholarship. 
but I tried hard. I did my best and I enjoyed a team atmosphere. Um, and that's the camaraderie that comes with it, right? Is these lifelong memories and experiences that come from just being on a field playing something. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking the other night and I just brought it up. What, what, nobody says, Hey, I wish I ate more ice cream. Like yeah. That, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? No, like, you're right. Right. But they all say, I wish I played harder. Yep. I wish I did more. Yep. I so, wish I'd gone for that run yesterday. So you're killing yourself in ballet and, and then what? And then you became a rower? Yep. So, cause there's uh, a lot of ballerinas that become rowers. Totally. It's right. totally normal. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I, like I said, I wasn't good enough to play at a division one school, but I wanted to go to the university of Washington, the best school in the Northwest. Um, mm-hmm. and so they send out letters. Most rowing programs do this that say, and ours at UW was, do you want to be a national champion? And I was like, I do want to be a national champion. Who, does, <laughs> who doesn't, who want, doesn't want, to want to do that? Right? right. Um, but I didn't know what rowing was. And a few weeks later was the Sydney Olympics. And so I watched the rowing races. Um, and I was like, I could definitely do that. I enjoy water. I like a team. Let's do this. And so I showed up, um, about a hundred people, a hundred women showed up on that first day of practice and they teach you. I mean, they teach you here's what an oar is here's what the water is here's what your boat and you just learn um how old were you at this point so i was 18 freshman yeah. in college first day of classes i yeah. go down to the boathouse that day um and is that rare that 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 um rowers start at that no point? it's it happens all the time i yeah. said most of us i think my class had three scholarship people um and maybe s- 10 people that had rode before and it happens all over the world. So I, uh, I always push, um, high schoolers to go try rowing men and women while in high school, uh, in high school, or if you're going to college, college. if you aren't good enough to play whatever sport you played your entire life, go out for rowing because one is an amazing sport. Um, the teamwork, the strength, the camaraderie that comes with it. And you don't have to be great at first, but you'll still be on the team, potentially get a scholarship like I did, and you have good chances of winning national champions. In our school, we've had 17 gold medals, um, over 100 people, rowers over the course of the last 100 years have been on Olympic teams. Wow. We create Olympic teams and national teams there right. at the University you of Washington. For, you forge it somehow. It's it's an. Inc- I think I, I think I saw a documentary. Boys in the boat is yes. what we're best known for yes. right now. The oh. 1936 men's yes. team that won the Olympics awesome. in front of Hitler. Yep, yeah. it's pretty amazing. The history and the story that that we have. It's an incredible organization to be a part of, and a lot of lessons learned from that, from time management to teamwork to how hard can I push my body. Um, I am. Um, I was with. Um, the current president of Alibaba. Okay. He, he's a pretty big deal. And he yeah. he and his brother own uh, earned uh, gold medals in rowing. Okay. And he said, um, we push so hard, mm-hmm. it was unhealthy. Yeah. So just the other day, I found in one of my boxes, literally like last week, memory box of piece of paper that I had up. And this is kind of talks to setting goals. I had it up in my room in my sorority. And what was on it was uh, find your swing, push hard, row until you throw up. Literally, those are what the goals that I wrote for myself that race season. Uh, well, I wouldn't recommend pushing yourself to you. No, I think but that's I, the I mentality think... of like, I got to push hard. I got to do my best because for my teammates in front. At the end of this podcast, we, we usually ask, like, give us three tips that yeah. somebody on the couch could could uh, use to enhance their life. And I yeah. think those are the three. Yeah, right. we, should, we should get <laughs> Work so hard, you throw up. <laughs> I um... I never made that, by the way. I never threw up. <laughs> so you didn't get a, I didn't you didn't get a goal. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're done with rowing. Mm-hmm. I, I guess you did four years. Four years. Right? Yep. Then what? Uh, I joined the Army. Um, so all my busyness in high school, I carried on into college, and one of those activities was ROTC. Right. Uh, so I joined the Army in 2004 as an officer. Um, about 18 months later, I was in Iraq um, on my first deployment. Um, and How was that? It was really tough. Um, I We were doing... I was a en- combat engineer, um, but as a woman back then, I couldn't do combat engineer things, which at the time was go search for IEDs. Um, so I saw all my buddies doing this tough work, and I spent a lot of time doing logistics runs, um, which was tough because you're still out find, you know, around IEDs, and the time, it was a big surge in Iraq at that point. Um, it was really my first time being away from home. Um so it was hard. I had a really hard time with some of my leadership then. Um, so that was definitely a challenge that I had to overcome. And then it's Iraq and like 100 plus degrees out and sandy and sweaty. But, and but so you're going through, it's 100 plus degrees out. You've yeah. got those issues. You're in Iraq, yeah. right? You're probably a little nervous. 
the ballet training, the rowing, yeah. right? The mom that's a monomaniac. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all helps, I would think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So one of the weird things that I got out of rowing is knowing my distances really well, 500 meters, 1,000 meters, etc. And so to this day, 14 years later in the Army, if I'm looking at a map and saying I got to go 500 meters, 1,000 meters, I'm picturing the race course. Like to this day, I'm looking down Lake Washington, Mont Lake Cut, what that looks like yeah. um, and where the finish line is. And sometimes I'll, you'll even hear me talking like 10 more strokes, 10 more strokes, power 10 through this, get through this. Cause nice. it's lessons learned from sports. From sport. Yeah. Um, so it's weird. The little things that you carry on through your life that literally in the army, I, I, I love of. this concept of a frame of reference. So you, you, you develop this frame of reference, yeah. um, there. And so when the going gets tough, you probably, you tell me if I'm wrong, can say to yourself, well, it's not that bad. Yep. It's not like, yep. It's not like when I was rowing this yeah. time in the rain. Yeah, and, yep. Right? Yep. exactly. Um, so I did, I've done two deployments in Iraq and that was all as an engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I decided to go into special operations. Um, Pretty common. Totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> but for women in the Army, this is the place to be. And civil yeah. affairs is what I do. Um, and for anybody, right? Special operations is the place to be. You've got incredible opportunities and missions and making strategic effects. Um, you get to go all over the world, um, not just Iraq and Afghanistan. And so it's been it's been incredible. Um, so I, I went over to civil affairs, went through the course, and... About a year after graduating the course, I went to my first Afghanistan deployment. Um, that one was pretty tough. It was the first time that I truly was like, I'm responsible for people and my decisions could mean whether or not they live or die um, sure. or get hurt or whatever. We were doing, um, this was 2011, we were doing what's called village stability operations. And so we were living in towns and villages uh, in mud huts out there. And so... Um, it was me, my civil affairs team, which was four people, a uh, special forces uh, detachment, which is about 12 people, and then some infantry guys um, to help with security, and then our Afghans. So about 30 some odd people living out there. Um, I was the only woman there. Um, the Afghans were great. They painted my little like bathroom thing hot pink for me. Oh, that's <laughs> that nice. was kind of cool. That's awesome. Um, and so I did that for a year at about 10,000 feet. Um, in the border of Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, let's take a quick break. Okay. Why don't we go? Actually, there's some water out there. We'll go for a quick row. Okay, let's do it. We'll I saw back. it's really flat out there. Really so flat. it's good water. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> don't worry, Spartans. We'll be right back to our episode in a second. But we want to take a quick uh, sponsorship time out here and talk about our sponsor, Gone Rogue High Protein Chips. This is kind of a, as Rogue would imply, kind of a, a new source for protein here. This is a cross or a merger, if you will, between a jerky and a potato chip. I mean, high in protein, looks like a chip, tastes great. It's a hybrid, right? Parental it material, is. F1. I think what? It's chicken and jerky or chips. Chip. Would it be chicks? <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So if you think about, like, I mean, this is something I've never seen before, but if you think about how, you know, indigenous cultures are over, whenever you would hunt and gather, you would have to find a way to smoke or dry or preserve your meat so you could have it for the whole season or make pemmican to bring with you on the trail. So this is kind of just a modern day way to preserve that meat and bring it with you. When speaking of bringing meat with you, I've been at a lot of long distance races where you see people will have their their different forms of, of protein that they want to bring on the trail with them. And uh, you see a lot of jerky out there and things like that. It all adds weight. And it sounds crazy, but when you're running at altitude, you want almost no weight. So this, what is it? 17 Super grams of protein. Light. I mean, too. It's seven, like, 17 grams of protein in two ounces. One, I believe that's what it was in one, one ounce one, yeah. and only two carbs. So, um, you know, I don't see this as a sitting on the couch kind of snack. I see this as an active bring your food with you kind of snack. So if you want to go rogue. You should go to Gone. GoneRogueSnacks.com. GoneRogueSnacks.com. Use Spartan25. That's the code that will get you 25% off, and you can take this to your next race. You're a pretty good rower. Uh, I was at one point. <laughs> I was pretty good. I can't say I found my swing. <laughs> you got to keep working. You got to yeah. get on that ergometer. It'll make you better. Um, yeah, what makes, what makes a good mentor or a mentee? Um, so for a mentor, I think you really got to challenge the individual. You are not just there to feed them the answer to things. You got to help them find out, you know, what is how, what they can do, find their purpose. But you also have to kind of show the path in a way, like here's some options. Here's some other people that have done it this way. Um, but that critical constructive feedback is key for them because you, you learn from failures. Everyone learns from failures, um, and learns from something that they need to do better at. Um, and so mentors need to be able to say that and be kind of sometimes that mirror. Um, and then I'd say the other part is 
be open to connecting them to your network. Um, help them find their network. Help them open up your network because sponsorship is kind of the next part. So um, somebody that's willing to advocate for them and help them find that next job, that next thing that inspires them that they're good at. Um, and those are, uh, I think those are important parts of being a mentor. <laughs> um, tomorrow... Yep. You are leading a team? Yeah. Leading with a team at the Spartan Race? Uh, my company is here. So the I'm ballerina a ballerina com- company? Not the ballerina company. <laughs> the art companies are just in my lifeline yeah. here. No, so I'm a company commander uh, for a civil affairs unit. Nice. And so we were out doing some training uh, in the area. And so we are going to go run the race tomorrow. How big is the company? Um, we are 30 people. Oh, wow. We're really small. We're small companies in, uh, in units in civil affairs and special operations in general. Um, so we'll be out there tomorrow. Get, um, some, get some clips on, on your phone and we'll, and we'll tie it into the podcast. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it'll be good. Um, we're deploying here in a few months. And so this is a really good team building opportunity, right? You yeah. all learn I from, like yeah. you know, being struggling together. Um, and so this You're going to love the uh, bucket carry. Oh, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> We've been running and training and climbing ropes back there at Fort Bragg. So oh, good. We're, we're ready for it. My first Spartan race was uh, actually on my leave from after. Afghanistan. I got off the plane, and the next day did my first Spartan race. Where was that? Um, out in Portland. Oh, awesome! Yeah, you had fun. Yeah, it was good. It was good. And was that random? Did you know us at that point as an organization, or you didn't? Um, I think I, my husband had. So I got married at that point, um, or we were engaged actually. Yeah. So he had kind of heard about it. Um, I'd been into functional fitness at that point too. It's kind of like the thing you do when you come into special operations, sure. and. Um, and so I had heard about it, and it was a planned thing. We knew that I was going to be taking leave then, and so I was pretty fit at that and point. You, and you loved great. it. I loved it. It was good. Was it better, had, better than rowing? Uh, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I got some pretty strong heritage and legacy with rowing. That's fair. Um, but it was obviously very tough. Um, I had a good scar on my leg for a while. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, yeah. so let's let's um, let's wrap it up and, and talk about the three things. I, I, yeah. I say we take those three things yeah. and we apply it. To regular life, right? So yeah. what was the first one you had written down? Um, so it was row hard, I think, or find your swing, actually. Find, find your swing. swing. So how, how can we apply that to regular civilian? Yeah, regular non-ro- people. <laughs> but, I, but I think it's that's find, find your, your purpose. Yeah, right? it's find your rhythm, yeah. what inspires you, what motivates you. Um, and find, and I would add to that now, find somebody that helps you do that. Um, I'm a big mentor type. It takes person. a village. Yep, right. yep, you got it. And that's what it is about teamwork. And, and uh, there's a quote from George Pocock, who's a big rowing, um, you know, legacy um, legend in our in our world. Who he said uh, something to the effect of, you know, I I hear men scream out when they found their swing because um, it's just this incredible feeling that you will never forget in your life. Um, yeah. Is when your boat has it and you're on this flat water, you're pushing hard, your oars going in the water. And you're just doing it. Everyone's in sync and it's incredible. And so when you found your rhythm, you found what motivates you and you are just humming. You're just going. I I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. What's the second one? Uh, I think it was just work hard. Determination. I mean, there's no way around it, right? There's no magic pill. There's no, you you gotta do the work. Yep, and you got to be deserving of it, right? You've got to yeah. be deserving of success, and you only get there from work. And I think you need to say, tell me what you think about this. I think you need to say about the work, like, I get to do this. Yeah. Not that I have to For do sure. this. For sure. Right? For sure. It's an honor to do what you're doing every day. Yeah. Um, and so then yeah. do it till you throw up. Yep. Do it till you throw <laughs> up at the very end. Push yourself as hard it's, as you possibly you should. can go. I mean, I, I had a guy come to me once. I was having him do a 100-mile snowshoe race. He had never done anything like this mm. before. And his girlfriend came over when he was at mile 16. He said, yeah. he can't go anymore this is ridiculous it's too dangerous you're an idiot I can't believe you pushed my boyfriend that hard and I said is he pissing blood because if he's not pissing blood let him keep going he's still got time and he got it done yeah right and And you really see what you can do because we all set boundaries that are not the actual boundary yeah right Yeah, because you know how hard you can go at that point. If you've hit that, if you've hit the the wall, right? If you have thrown up, if you have, you know, passed out, like not necessarily great, but at least you know what you can do. You know where the wall is. Yep. Yeah. So tell us about, um, as we wrap up here, tell us about Promote. Uh, So back on my last Afghanistan deployment, uh, a colleague and I started talking, Lila Kostani, we started talking about mentorship and our careers and and leader development, how we got to where we were and what was successful. Um, And so we 
we came across a lot of people that were getting out of the military at that point. And it was because of lack of leadership development, lack of mentorship, um, which for us was not our experience. And so we, we love what we do in special operations. It's an incredible opportunity. And so we went about, we got, we left that deployment and we started researching. We started talking is how do we make an impact? How do we make it better for the next person um, in this organization? How do we retain talent? And so in 2016, we became an official 501c3 nonprofit, and we are focused on leader development, mentorship, and we've kind of morphed a bit to meet the market and looking at inclusion and diversity. And we are focused in special operations. Um, Some of that is because of bandwidth. We're very small. There's like four of us working on this right now. Would you ever come to a company? Um, Yes, we would. We would. Awesome. Um, well, well, I'll have you up in Boston. We'll, do, we'll donate some money. We'll have you um, sit, That'd down be awesome. with, sit down with the team. Yeah, it's awesome. So we do classes. We do workshops. We work with um, a bunch of academics as well who focus on this. Sometimes we talk about how to be a mentor, how to be a mentee. And then what we've really been doing a lot the last four or five months is kind of focus groups and getting an understanding of what is happening. What's the culture of an organization? What are some things that maybe need to be fixed or not? And then we run through processes and workshops to address those problems. How do we address these problems as a team? How do we make people feel included that they, um, you know, have a purpose, they want to work there, they want to stay there, they feel like they're contributing um, to that organization. And a lot of that is through creating diverse teams, creating... Well, the good news is our company is pretty flawless. (laughs) Everything works perfectly, so you wouldn't have a lot of work. Yes, there's a lot of work. (laughs) Awesome. Uh, Thanks. How amazing was that? She comes from your world, uh, Frank and Tim. Yeah, I mean, ballet to special ops with a little, uh, what, rowing national championship sprinkled in? Right. Uh, she is. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I get it. It's impressive. It, it's extraordinarily impressive. Yeah. She, she, is a, she is a woman driven. And, and what I really liked about it is when, when you said to her when she was young, you didn't really like it. She said, no, 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 I loved it. I loved it. The more my mom pushed me, the more I wanted. The more responsibility I get, the more I want. You know, I mean, she pushes. But that's rare, right? They say, they say, they say, they say some some athletes, some amazing athletes. There's the coyotes are out. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> some amazing athletes have great talent. Some have great drive. But the ones that like are gold can, can medalists, combine they, they combine yeah. those two. And she Absolutely. sounds like she had both. Well, she was. She had no background in rowing. Like, went to the University of Washington when they approached her. You know, and said, do you want to be part of a national or a national championship? Boom. That's what it took. They sold her and she bought into it hook, line and sinker, you know, and then she was talking about Rody to throw up. You know, I mean, she pushed herself that hard. That seems like a motto you could get behind. Yeah, yeah no, I remember calling. I have a, I have some mentors in their 80s and uh, we talk sometimes early in the morning and, and like, they talk like this. <laughs> they talk like this with their hands like Italians. And and one of them said to me, what are you doing? It was like 5 a.m. I said, I'm doing sprints. Mm-hmm. And he said, you're going hard. And I said, yeah, I go till I throw up. And so that's a, that is a motto. That's yeah. a Spartan motto. But you have gave up cannolis in the morning, right? <laughs> you gotta eat the cannolis in the morning <laughs> before you throw up. Yes. But can I ask you guys a question? Because yes. in all seriousness, like I have no baseline understanding for what it's like to be leading people into situations where you really are making decisions that can affect the course of their life. Well, this young lady, well, we, we she's, she's, she's quite special. Tomorrow. Oh yeah, this young lady's quite special. You know, you talk about breaking the mold, getting out of your comfort zone. You know, here she is, young female warrior, special operations, getting it into places where most men in America don't want to go. And she's a great role model, great leader, great mentor. And, um, you know, this is one of the secrets of our military is how we bring in everyone out of society train them, and then set them on their way to do goodness worldwide. And that's exactly what she's doing. Great role model for our young ladies out there. She's a serious role model. I mean, how many of her are there in the military, would you say, at that level? Like that kind of personality, that kind of drive? Well, Well, there's hundreds. I I think the military is full of them. But do you know special operators? Yes. Oh. Yes. Full of them, hundreds, thousands? Listen, I, I am a firm believer that any any 18, 19, 25-year-old, whatever, that raises their right hand nowadays and says, I join, I will, you know, as you talk about, make the public commitment. They're, they're all special. And, 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 and you know, well and it's special for their skills, not for, for the individual. You know, it's not, okay, look at me, I'm special. Mm-hmm. It's I have special capabilities, I've got special gear, equipment, the rest of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But she, she is certainly... 
a uh, somebody to look up to. But I, I think there are many other people in our military that you, you could say the same about. Uh, but for her, what you know, what stuck out for me is she was a combat engineer. And she went to combat, and she had to kind of stand back because she wasn't allowed under the rules uh, to kind of go forward, right? It's because she wasn't working for me at the time. Right. So, <laughs> so she she didn't like that. She didn't like the way it felt, right? That others were going out, mm-hmm. and then she talked about she was still on route. The, rule, the rules because she was a female. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, those have evolved. But she raised her hand again. So when you say, "Hey, I want to be in special ops," you know, there's a tryout. You know, there's a selection there. You've got to go prove yourself and you've got to raise your hand. You've got to volunteer again to go do it. And she did it. And then she, you know, going into uh, Afghanistan in this, she talked about village stability operations. A good friend of mine that you've interviewed, Scott Mann, uh, started that program or was the architect of that program. And I think we talked about it on his podcast, you know, a year ago or so. If you've ever seen the old movie, uh, The Magnificent Seven, that is a village stability operations. That was SF guys, special forces guys, going into an Afghan village and living with them. So most of the model is, as Frank will tell you, you live on a fob forward operating base. You live in a big base. Very few people go out beyond that those borders, right? These guys were living in that town, and when they go to sleep at night, they're putting their their safety in the hands of the locals. And she was out there with thirty men by herself. Uh, that, that that's um, quite the iron major. Yeah, good that, woman. That, that's a good warrior. Yeah, that's a yeah. tough woman. Mm-hmm. What a great leader. Yeah, it shows what's possible, mm-hmm. right? Because like we got a, a, a like for female role models, they 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 are out there. But it's nice that we were able to showcase such a strong one, right? Well, she she did more than this, though, right? Because she had trouble or she wasn't satisfied with the leadership she was getting, right? As a female. And she has started her own charity, her own uh, charity, her own group, uh, Promote. And it's her and women who are um, empowering themselves uh, to identify good leadership and then take those leadership traits on. And, you know, it was funny how many of them had the same leaders in their background that said, oh, hey, I don't care that you're a woman. I, I care that you're good. You know? I love that. Let's ask the question. If, um, if you're a woman out there and you're listening to this, you're watching this, uh, let's hear your story. I want to know, right? I mean, there's lots of warriors out there, like you said. Oh, yeah. And and um, doesn't just have to be in rowing, doesn't have to be in special ops, but could be a mom of eight. Could be. Uh, and they're out there in our military. Yeah. 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 Like Margaret Mead says, you know, never mm-hmm. doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Here's, here's someone doing that. So, With that, let's change the world. Subscribe. Yep. Get 500,000 of your closest friends to subscribe with you. <laughs> and we will see you tomorrow. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Gone Rogue High Protein Chips. 17 grams of protein in one crunchy ounce. Visit GoneRogueSnacks.com, enter promo code SPARTAN25 for 25% off.